Hello guys, this is Avcor and I created a tier list for the current meta. Some people may argue with this tier list, but this is based on my experience. So when you look at this tier list, this is based on real playtesting. Some people may be shocked where characters are, but it makes a lot of sense when you really think about it. So we'll get started with food. Food characters are characters that you may use at the beginning, but you want to drop off as soon as possible because they're material and nothing more. Notable mentions are uh, Revenant Hunter. I mean, yeah, Mournful Hunter, I mean. Mournful Hunter is absolute garbage. He has a single eye AoE. He doesn't have damage increase. He applies curse. He dies in order to activate one of his effects, which is an AoE attack. He's not really that great. Another character that is not really that great that's in the food tier is... What's her name? Savage Beast Alpha. Savage Beast Alpha is a garbage unit. Um, she is a tank. Which is okay. Uh, she has bleed effect on her attack. There's a 100% chance of applying reduced damage effect on two random allied targets, which seems great. And after being attacked, she recovers 2% of her HP. She doesn't have damage reduction in her kit. She has very low stats for a tank. And the damage reduction that she applies, other characters do better. And B tier, there's another tank that totally outclasses her. So that reduces her to only one purpose and that is to be food other characters that you see in this tier are just food I won't even bother going over them because they're not that good so if we go to C tier C tier are characters that you can use at the beginning of the game um, you get around eight or seven stars that kind of fall off because they're just better characters that you have access to that do the job better some notable mentions are Luminescent Light. I think Luminescent Light is a solid character that you could take throughout the game. Uh, never put her past 9 stars. But she's that extra filler character when you need a light character to fill in a spot. Especially when you get to Elemental Tower. Because light characters are so hard to build that it's okay to take Luminescent Light to 9 stars. Because if, you, if you're thinking... In applying your thinking properly, you'll spend your elemental stones only on light and dark. So you should get plenty of opportunities to get her. And she's a really great unit for that purpose. She's an assassin, so she targets units with the lowest HP, which is really good. Um, solid unit, but there's just better characters that do her job. And we'll go over those. Uh, we have Gawain. Gawain's a solid tank, but he is totally outclassed by Shield Apartha. Who actually does his job like way better because he only has 80% on his rage attack to freeze whereas she has 100%. His damage reduction is not as high and his stat mods are not as high. Uh, generally you pretty much want to use him to get to 9 stars and when you start getting other units because there's like a bunch of tanks in this game that just pretty much outperform him. So he's a C character. Connie, uh, Mida Partha, is a niche character. She's decent, but she needs to be in a box that has constant ways to freeze targets. If not, she falls off. Because she can only do her rage skills, she builds her rage extremely fast. But outside of that, it's hard to justify her use. Because she has an issue with speed. Um... She has explosive DPS potential. And after the unit's frozen, she applies Shatter, which does 540% attack to one enemy, uh, which is really good. Um, but her, like, second ability is she removes Frozen and Stun for herself, which is at a 50% chance, which is kind of low, considering that she needs to be ready to attack when the opportunity comes, which rarely comes sometimes and even when you awaken her it's only 75% which is really kind of garbage 
Yeah. Um, yeah, she's garbage. Uh, Artemis is another character that is kind of garbage. She's actually really good at the beginning of the game. But when you find out that she can't one-shot enemies, her flare kind of just like drops off the face of the map. Because if she can't one-shot enemies, she can't apply her skill in her rage in her her rage skill to kill another unit, so she falls off really fast. I mean, her ability to hit multiple units is pretty good. And now carry you through some of the mid game, but it's only one one or twenty percent attack and to targets in the mid and front rows, which is not that great. Uh, yes, in order to increase her damage, she has to kill enemies. It's just really hard to justify her uh, at the beginning of mid-game. It's just hard to say that she's actually good. And the last person I'll talk about is in water. And that'll be Siren. Siren's actually a solid character. But overall, she's outclassed by DPS mages that do her job better there's a lot of dps mages will go over that do her job better one's even an assassin so it's kind of hard to justify her existence when you get past mid game as the content gets a lot harder and the demands on her get a lot higher because her dps output is not that great her stats are solid i mean overall solid and she can remove debuffs from allies and increase crit rate she can increase her damage dealt. And she puts like damage reduction, which is all pretty solid, but it's pretty solid until you get to mid game content. So that's where we must move on. So B tier is still the lower end. They can actually do mid game content and they're good on a budget. And we'll start with uh, two characters in Pyre. Which they're really good on a budget. One's not so good because she's actually a core hero. But she's just not as good as other heroes. We'll talk about Iron Fist. Iron Fist is an honorable mention. Because she is one of those characters that you can build fast and get a lot of mileage out of her. Uh, she's pretty much the dollar burger of characters in this game. as Because you can build her fast, you can get through a lot of content. And she's able to apply her trade really well till you get to the end of mid game content. And then she falls off hard. Uh, the reason she falls off hard is first of all, she is limited. Her rage skill actually does a lot of damage, and she actually gets life steal from that. Her second skill is where she falls off when she just gives herself counter attack. That's all it does. It really doesn't enhance her gameplay beyond that. And there's runes and stuff that can actually give you counterattack. And then she has another skill that just reduces her damage. Overall, she's kind of limited. But for what you get out of her, it's really good. So she's really good on a budget. So the next character we'll talk about in Fire is actually Ken, Flower, Flower Frenzy. She's actually a really good DPS. Um, her rage skill cannot be counterattacked. Uh, she attacks like random enemies with five shots. Um, but she has to actually kill units in order to actually pump up her attack. So that's kind of weird. Like, the more she kills, the better she gets at, uh, the more damage she deals. And she has a opportunity to apply a 50% chance to apply burn. And when you get to her potential awakening. And you, she gets to apply armor shredder. And you actually get damage increase. And when somebody's burned she actually adds on damage to increase. Really limited kit. Uh, they could have done better with her. But they did not. Uh, yeah. The next character we'll talk about is... Genkuro Oni Mash Ronin. He actually has one of the best designs in the game. But he kind of falls off after that. His Lotus Dance actually gives him good burst. He has good burst damage. And he'll apply his stacks of burn. And if the target's burn, he gets crit. 
he gets like increased crit damage but he needs high crit rate and there's nothing in his kit that gives him high crit rate and his third skill is like garbage because after being attacked there's a 30 percent chance to block that attack at the block is successful then reduce damage by 50 percent which is really good but 30 percent is really bad and when you get to his awakening yeah you're getting guaranteed crit you get denied heal and you get increased crit damage but no crit rate so it's kind of whatever um and then we look at uh frost princess frost princess is like one of those characters that when you get get to mid game content she falls off hard but the simple fact is her one skill in combination with her rage skill is pretty unique uh, like at the start of the first turn she inflicts 102 damage to all enemies when you combine that with her rage skill she does a lot of damage at the beginning of the turn but then it falls off because that's all her second skill does so like even when her third skill deep freeze like she applied when she uses her rage skills there's a 60% chance to apply slow effect increases chance to apply frozen against slow enemies by 5% it's just too conditional and it just doesn't work at the end of, at the end of the game so it's She's B tier. A tier has some solid heroes in here. Daughter of the Sea is a really good healer with regeneration capabilities, but she has no revive, so she's a mediocre healer. Then we get to Julius. Um, Julius is really good at the beginning of the game in mid in mid game, and then he falls off hard because he's a one trick pony. His one skill actually lets him be in the egg state, and then he can revive on the next turn, but it does nothing else. And his taking options are low. The fact that he applies burn on an AOE skill as a tank is pretty amazing. And he has uh, damage reduction in his kit, which is pretty good. <gasps> so I can actually say that uh, he's actually decent. And he can apply burn when he attacks. But he's still meh. And we get to these two characters. Uh, Revenant Knight and Smiley Miracle. Revenant Knight and Smiley Miracle are key characters in this game as if you're on a budget they're kind of must-haves because the bonuses from dark and light are so great that you want to have as many dark and lights on your team as possible to get those stat bonuses on your alignment so you can do as much damage and take as much damage as possible revenant knight is one of the best budget takes in the game hands down even above iron fist but Iron Fist is a little cheaper because she's not a dark elemental hero. If you're smart, you only use your elemental stones on light and dark, and you should get plenty of this guy. This guy has life steal. He can actually warp men off the battlefield to slow down the pace of the game, and he has damage reduction in his kit. Even his awakening is pretty solid. When you look at what he gets from his potential awakening, after he cast reaper of souls he actually gets damage reduction which is pretty good you know after being attacked this dude can actually apply curse to the attacker that's passive and undead body gets 10 percent more damage reduction and he has life steal he's really good on a budget alex is really good and if you don't spend money on the game it's okay to take him to 10 stars it really is same with smiling miracle it's okay to take Smiling Miracle to 10 stars if you don't have money and you don't spend money on the game. People will argue against this, but this game is really expensive. And if you don't want to spend money, Smiling Miracle and Revenant Knight are the way to go. Smiling Miracle is one of the cheapest heroes, healers that have Revive in our kit. Their healing output is not so great. Because she doesn't have healing increase in her uh, fourth slot skill. But she has the power to purify heroes and has damage reduction, which is solid. So we start getting to the better heroes and A plus tier. This is where people may um, have arguments, but this is based on playtesting. Uh, Howling Wind Tesserosa is good, but her stats are not the greatest. What I will say is. She's actually solid if you have a plan in mind when you're setting up your team. And if you know where the team is lined up, she's pretty good at that. 
But in general PvP content, you don't know how the enemy has set up his set up their team. So you can only guess where to place her. And sometimes when you place her in the wrong place, you get bad results. Dragon Princess is a really good character, but she takes high investment in order to compete with the top tier heroes because she's a single target damage dealer with AoE potential. And depending on how much resources you put into her is what you get out of her. Some people work really well with her. I actually use her myself, but considering what I go up against, I know that she belongs in A plus tier. She does not belong in S tier. You're just better heroes that do the job better of DPS. But if you invest in her and you get her red talisman, she's actually really comparable to S heroes if you do so. Going on to the dark healer, I think dark healer got the dark heroes got kind of like snubbed with uh, underworld strider. There's a way better dark healer that's gonna come, and I think everybody should spend money on him because he can attack and revive and heal at the same time. The dude's pretty busted, and this dude. Underworld Strider will disappear because of that. But the problem is, he doesn't heal passively outside of his rage skill. Um, even his soul mastery actually gives him healing increase. And when using rage skills for every tick of healing done, there's a 40% chance to apply soul power effect to the target, which is okay, but there's no passive healing. So when he's not using his rage skill, he's not healing people unless you put talismans or runes on him. An enemy of death is kind of so so. At the start of the second round, when any of you has died, you'll revive them. But you get this gay dispense of the dead effect where they deal damage to themselves every turn, which kind of sucks. Um, yeah. Yeah, even his uh, awakening is pretty pretty garbage. Uh, yeah, Underworld Strider is trash. Um, there's just better healers when we get up to the top here that do his job better. He's all right, but he needs uh, another healer with him, like uh, Daughter of the Sea or Smiling Miracle, somebody who can actually consistently heal turn after turn. Even his best like ally would be Lord of Time or super twins to be honest but we move on to wendy wendy is a good hero uh she's a solid dps she's green uh there's better there's better offensive units in green unfortunately because green is pretty stacked but you get a lot of mileage out of her she does get damage increase in her kit and her basic attacks will apply one to two stacks of bleed if the enemy is the stun, applies one stack of bleed, which is situational. Her rage skill is actually codependent on if she has bleed and she will apply armor shredder. Her second skill is like a combo attack, but it's situational. But when everything goes right, she's pretty awesome. But if not, she's not that great. I like Shield of Partha, but Shield of Partha belongs in A+, because she's limited in her defensive capabilities. She can defend for herself, but she does not defend for the team, per se. She has CC in her kit, which is really good, and she has the potential to freeze, which is really good, which puts her in A+, tier, but she can't go any higher than this, because the meta has shifted so fast in the last three months that there are better tanks out there that do more for the team than she does. But still, she's a solid unit. Um, Endless Storm is actually a good mage. She actually has the power to assassinate targets, which makes her really good. That's what, that's what, that's why she surpasses, uh, Wendy. Because she can actually just pretty much target those with the lowest HP, which is really important in this game. As you want to clear the board as fast as possible, because this game is like on a timer. So you want characters like Endless Storm. She would be higher if she was a dark or light element. And she needs bleed in order to maximize her full potential. Which kind of sucks. But they had to put limits on her because she'd be a broken character otherwise. Now I'm going to... I think one of the best uh, attackers in Wind is Tempest Dragon, Constantia. Constantia is good because he can consistently AOE the 
back and mid row with his basic attack and his AOE attacks the mid and back row so he doesn't need to be an assassin. He works really well with Elementalist as he has the ability to just tear apart the back line where people like Shield Apartha cannot defend. So this guy actually weakens Shield Apartha. That's why she's so low because the characters like him. And he applies the Armor Shredder to the target 100% which is really amazing. He has damage increase in his kit. His potential awakening increases his speed and he actually has a 50% chance to apply heal reduction which is good and he has more damage increase pretty solid there's just other characters that do his job a little better so we go to S tier people may complain about the characters in S tier but these characters belong here they don't belong any higher though uh, honorable mentions are Morlock Morlock is a great buffer and a great tank his ability to add shield and crit lifesteal is really awesome but you have to crit in order to get it there's a hundred percent chance for damage and increased crit rate which pretty much rounds out this guy's buffing ability he's one of the best buffers in the game but in order to maximize his ladder abilities he would like to have fire units in his team and that's what kind of limits him if he was able to achieve those speeds without fire units he'd be higher <laughs> excuse me but he's a must have for fire teams pretty much and we go to sinister dragoon sinister dragoon is a really good dps but she suffers from the single target DPS syndrome where she would like to have the best equipment and the best runes in order to maximize her damage. As characters tend not to be too squishy in this game. There are certain characters that are really squishy. And sometimes you can kill them. But most of the time they're in the back and they're protected by other characters like Lord of the Dead and, and Dragon Master Don. So they're hard to kill. And she needs curse in order to get her true damage effect. Which kind of sucks. She can apply curse herself. But you rage skill at the beginning of the game. Not at the end of the game. And not at the middle of the game. You cycle between your rage skills. You will get a rage skill at the beginning of your turn. And then like two to three turns later you'll get that rage skill again. You would like to have curse placed upon the enemy before she attacks so she needs to be in specific teams in order to maximize her damage effect though she actually is able to increase her crit rate and crit damage and she gets CC immune which allows her the opportunity to use those skills and she has damage reduction in her kit and her rage skill silences people so she's really good you just need to create a team around her and some of these other characters that are higher than her don't need teams to be created around them. They actually support the teams that they're in. Scarlet Velvet is actually the strongest DPS in Fire currently. Why I say that is she actually gets damage increased in her kit and she applies Crimson Heartbeat to the first enemy. And Crimson Heartbeat upon death deals 70% plus 10% burn stacks damage to all enemies which is really good. Because she actually can apply this effect really easily and kill enemies really easily. Because her rage skill actually does a lot of damage. And she has a chance of stun which is really good. Especially for a fire unit because that's kind of out of their purview. So like even applying burn. She's a really good fire unit but out of out of fire she's not that great because she needs burn stacks in order to maximize her damage that's why she doesn't go any higher in the s tiers baby shark is really good i think baby shark is the second best water dps in the game the thing about baby shark to remember is she's not the greatest damage dealer but she is one of the best damage dealers in water and the fact that she is able to debuff the opponent to high hell 
makes her an excellent unit to build a team around. Um, you like to pair her with water units, but that is not necessary because with her awakening, she can actually apply freeze. And she gets damage increase. And she gets AoE. So she's an overall overall good uh, attacker. But she falls off compared to the other DPSs ahead of her. It's kind of sad because she's really good. But the DPSs and the S plus and above are really insane. It just shows you that the power creep in this game is real. So now we go to Sylvie. Sylvie is actually a really good light DPS. She just gets outclassed by the other light DPSs in the game. The thing about her that separates her, she can actually buff as well. She actually gives counterattack and she applies damage increased on herself. Counterattack is actually really important. Depending on the units that you are able to give the counterattack to can actually swing the game. Um... She would love to give counterattack to someone like Lord of the Dead or Sun Wukong or, or Blazing Dragoon. Someone who could really maximize the power of those effects. And if she gets killed, she can survive with one life. So she's a really excellent unit. Omega is another unit that is really good. Omega is like one of the best tanks in the game. But there are like one, two, three four tanks that outperform him which isn't which isn't bad because this game has pretty solid tanks he has self heal in his kit he has 10 percent damage reduction and he has 50 percent chance again preemptive strike and you're guaranteed to move first which is really good and the fact that he can like cancel raid skills is really good and he restores 10 percent of his hp his awakening is actually pretty solid. And he reduces the damage received by all heals by 25% when Quantos shield is up. So when the rage skill is not being used, he gets a significant damage reduction, which is really amazing. And his HP restored, store is increased, and his damage reduction is increased. Omega is really good. And if you don't get the other tanks that I mentioned before him, he's a really good build. But he's light, so you have to consider that. Garde is actually the best light tank in the game. Garde is actually one of those tried and true solid tank taunt units that every game kind of needs. And he does this really well, and he has counter attack. Taunt is really good in this game because it stops rage skills. It stops skills with other effects. Um, few people get past it. Blazing Dragoon gets past it, but most people don't. So the fact that he can taunt units is really good, and he gets 80% on that. And he has a 45% chance to taunt another enemy. And he gets counterattack on himself. And he buffs by increasing damage increase. And he has 10% damage reduction. And his rage skill actually adds shield, which is really good. Which is another layer of protection. His awakening is pretty good. At the start of battle he gains a shield effect. There's an additional 45% chance to taunt a third enemy. So sometimes he can do three enemies which is really amazing. And if you combine that with talismans that put taunt. He becomes really annoying and he gets damage reduction. He's a really great tank. Um, the next three tanks. The next four tanks. There's four tanks that are above him. And there's uh, five tanks that is above Omega. And that's not bad because they have pretty good tanks in this game. I talk about S plus tier. These guys kind of um, are kind of shaping the meta as we speak. And as we go forward, the, the rest of the characters kind of shape the meta. Two to mi three characters to mention on this game are, are characters that, at, that are at the start of the game. And are also of the core three elements which shows how really good they are. Dragon Master Don is not needed to explain. He's one of the best tanks in the game for a reason. Because he can block for everybody. So he's reducing damage for everybody. You can position him anywhere you want on the board. He actually applies bleed. As he counterattacks. He gets to counterattack. He gets he gets the buff. I mean even his awakening skills. Are slightly better than most tanks in the game. Because you're talking about. 
damage increase, counter attack, and you get a HP absorb shield. You get bleed, and you get to activate deep wound, which actually increases your bleed. His awakening actually implies increased damage to three targets. And when he defends enemies, he gets 20% damage reduction, which is insane, combined with the passive 10% damage reduction. So that's literally 40% damage reduction, which is pretty awesome. We'll go to Lord of Time next. Lord of Time is one of the best healers in the game, only second to Super Twins. There's a reason for that. Because she was designed, I think, comprehensively as one of the best staples of healing. Because her raid skill actually revives a unit with the lowest HP. And if there are no heroes, she'll recover HP equal to 320% of her attack. Which is really solid. There's just nothing else to say about her. And she actually, after her turn, she actually restores HP to two allies. And applied damage increase effect, which is super good. And her healing, her fourth skill gets her healing increase, and she purifies, which Smiley Miracle does, and then she applies shield, which Smiley Miracle doesn't, and she has healing increase, which Smiley Miracle doesn't. That's why she surpasses Smiley Miracle. <coughs> Excuse me. Her awakenings are really good. Also, she also gives increased damage when she's doing her rage skill. Blessing of Time hits three units, which is really good. And her last one gets her 20%, 10% damage reduction, which is really solid. Um, Lord of Time is a really solid healer. She ages really well in this game, so if you spent resources on her, don't be disappointed. It was well worth it. Another unit that is well worth the resources is Celestial Spear. Celestial Spear is one of the best DPS's in the core elemental pool for a couple of reasons. First of all, she's doing a lot with her little kit. So first of all, her Heaven Befall is one of the best AOE get, uh, attacks out of the core elements because not only is she hitting the second and first row, she's reducing damage and reducing crit rate. The reduced crit rate is so important in this game because crit can actually kill your team. For some reason, they... Uh, Really pumped up crit. There's three ways to increase crit rate, and that's good because crit rate can actually rip your team apart. And the fact that she actually uh, attacks this is super good. It only gets better for there with chivalry. She actually becomes a assassin because she attacks the unit with the lowest HP, dealing one or twenty percent damage and applying deny heal. This separates her for a lot of DPSs because you'll see later on when we get to SSS tier that. Morgan does the same thing in a different way, which makes her top, top tier. For her to do that gives her passive assassin and assassination abilities, and sometimes she actually kills a key unit for you and wins you the game. Her Knight's Creed actually increases her damage by 10%, and she recovers HP equal to 80% of her attack to two heroes with the lowest HP. It's not as much as people think, but it's still good. When you combine her with uh, two healer teams, she actually can uh, top your team off. Her awakenings are pretty good. She increases the attack of extra attacks by 140%. That means even combo. And she has a 50% chance to apply heal reduction, which was whatever. And increases her basic attack damage by 20%, which is really good. That means her uh, follow-up hits actually get increased damage which is really good she's still one of the best um dps's in the game uh she's only outclassed by these other characters because they're kind of super broken lord of the dead is a rising star lord of the dead is really good for a couple of reasons lord of the dead is actually a tank that can dps which is really weird he's a tank that actually can dps with his kit so not only can you put him up front, but you can expect him to actually deal out a good chunk of damage. With his rage skill, he can inflict like 306% of his attack to a single enemy. There's a 50% chance that 
this attack can actually get done twice and when he does it twice he's usually either getting close to killing the opponent or killing the opponent which is super cool this is where he actually has some defensive potential Kang uses the power of crown of souls with rotten soul in order to apply aging it's a 25 percent chance but this actually will increase and since he gets hit hit a lot and his team gets hit a lot this effect is a lot more common than you think Reduces damage dealt by 8% and it can stack. This is really good because <laughs> you take a beating in this game and over time he'll actually whittle away the offense of your opponents, which is amazing. So, of course, his fourth skill gives him that amazing 10% damage reduction and he applies Bloodthirst to himself, which increases his damage by 10% after attacking. And this is going to stack up to five times. So every time he attacks, his, his, his overall offense maximizes. It's, it's pretty amazing how much damage he can do once you spec him properly. And last but not least, when he dies, he enters Soul of, of the Dead for two rounds. And when he's dead, he can still keep attacking for two rounds. That's two rounds that you don't have to worry about healing him. And that could be clutch in certain game modes. Especially in PvP, so that's why he's so high on the list. His awakenings are really good as well. Uh, he has a 50%, so it goes to 75%, so it's literally guaranteed, like in a round, that you're going to start reducing people's damage. Um, it, it goes to 100%, so you actually do it twice all the time, and he gets the 10% damage effect. So that's why he's S+, because he's freaking amazing. Now we get to SS... These characters, you're going to see all the time. You already know who they are. And they're here for a couple of reasons. Um, we're looking at the two best tanks in the game are in dark. And we'll go over them. Puppet Master is good because he counters the revive meta. Because with his rage skill, he stops you from reviving. That's so important that you don't need runes or anything in order to get that effect. So you would like to put him up front and you would like for him to either hit a DPS or a tank. So once the tank can't revive, you can just push in and rip apart the team. He actually has sustain in his kit because of his puppet sorcery. At the end of each round, he can... <coughs> Excuse me. Um, attack the enemy soul or whatever. He absorbs the soul and gains cursed soul. As long as he hits, um, he actually heals your allies for 3% plus 5%. And it's immune to CC, which is so important. Uh, being immune to CC is important in this game, so he can get that effect off all the time. And you get damage, re damage reduction in his kit. 6% chance of applying curse. And when entering battle, reduces 25% damage of the hero with the highest attack. That's pretty good. Uh, his, his kit is super good. That's why he ages well in this game as a tank. Though the DPS meta is coming and tanks will no longer be relevant. So keep that in mind. His awakenings are really good. He has a 50% chance to apply soul in prison to the enemy with the lowest HP. That's really good. That's super good. That's really important. That's why you want to awaken this guy as soon as possible. And he gets purified. All negative stats and restores 30% of his max HP. This is what makes him an amazing tank. And he gets that amazing 10% damage reduction. He's absolutely one of the best tanks in the game. And the next dark tank is Lunar Shadow. Lunar Shadow may surprise people, but if you play DP, if you play PvP as much as I do, you know what this little doll can do. This little doll is one of the worst tanks to play against first of all like i said in my previous build videos he's a dark element and that means when once you pair her with other dark units you get that juicy stat increase for your team that's the first part but her ability to dps is insane once she gets her raid skill going she starts to taunt units with it's 25 percent but this will increase he she hits their first and mid row um for 172% damage. Most tanks don't have AOE damage. They're using single target. So this is pretty impressive already. But once it gets to Revenge of the Moon. This is really good. 
When she receives damage, there's a 100% chance to use revenge. And she'll deal 20% plus 20% times curse stacks damage to the enemy in the middle front row. And she can apply curse, which is whatever, but she can actually trigger this effect like two times every round. So every round she can actually counter attack twice and she hits the mid and front row. This is why she's so brutal. People don't understand that Lunar Shadow was actually meant to be a purely PvP tank. And people thought she was a jack of all trades and that was a weakness. But the way her kit is tuned, it makes her exceptionally effective on the in the front line. She pairs rail with Dragon Master Don. Because even though Dragon Master Don will reduce the damage that she takes. She ultimately will deal that damage back to the opponent with her Moon Tear. Moon Tear was kind of underrated, but once you pair her with people like Dragon Master Don and uh, Super Twins and Elementalist and Anubis, who actually can pump out stun, she becomes really good. Sometimes you want uh, Dragon Master Don to die so that she can uh, get escape so she can increase her inflicted damage by 20%. Which just makes her so oppressive because once she starts counterattacking with that damage increase, it's over. And once she starts getting her reduced stacks every turn, and you're not looking to get her reduced stacks of damage to like 20 or 10 or, or even 5, 15% is enough. 15% is more than enough. And then she starts to not die, which is really scary. And her chance to taunt actually increases with her uh, with her awakenings and the the 100 curse is kind of garbage and you get an increased damage which is really important the increased damage is more important than the curse because that's that's trash but those are the two best tanks in the game monkey king is a rising star monkey king is so good that if the other characters weren't so tuned he would actually be higher with more play testing, he might actually get higher because he's actually a really good DPS. There's a couple of reasons why Monkey King is so strong. First of all, he's a light element, so you get access to that GC light bonus when you add him with other light units, which are really good. Taste My Staff is one of the best single target damage skills in the game because he does 360 damage to a single enemy with a 70% chance of stunning targets. 70% is really high. As the target's HP is higher than 75%, it affects additional 140% true damage, which is not affected by defense. So you want this dude to go first. And if the target's HP is between 50 and 75%, then affect uh, additional 70% true damage. So like I said, you want him to go first. You would like him to go first and start to will the enemy. And then other people like Lord of the Dead are... Our, 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 our loon, or even um, even Succubus, our, our Puppet Master, especially uh, Blazing Dragoon and Morian can finish off the target. So he's really good for that. All his attacks inflict true damage. Additionally, every attack will first inflict damage equal to 7% of the target's HP. Um... It, it, you really would like for this guy to go first. That's why you want to pump up his speed. His speed is already at 108. So when he goes first, he's usually crippling an enemy. And then you just finish him off. And Art of the Doppelganger is kind of busted. Because he makes two golden bodies. Basically, he makes two of himself. And they have like 30% of his stats, his HP, and attack. And they can use raid skills. And when they die, they get divine power to them. His awakenings are pretty solid. There's a 30% chance to gain CC immune. And you increase the damage of your clones. And you get increased damage. Monkey King is super good. And I think he's just going to increase as the meta grows. Uh, Blade of Shadows Arloon is the best assassin in the game right now. That targets the lower stat of HP. She's pretty much geared in order to kill enemies and then hide. She would like to have somebody apply curse, but she doesn't really need it because she could apply curse herself. Um, her rage skill attacks the enemy with the lowest HP. She 
when she kills an enemy, she inflicts damage equal to 120% of her attack on all enemies and applies weakened and armor shredder effects to them. Also, she enters like in a hiding state. This is really good because she's usually killing the unit anyway. That's what you want her to do. That's what you expect her to do. And that's what she can do. That's why she like, wants Berserk uh, for for on her slots and her talisman. So that's that. So, of course, she gets the 10% damage increase. And her basic attack has a 50% chance of inflicting stun on a target. That's why she sits in SS tier because she is so... The way she's tuned, she's like one of the perfect assassins in the game. Like when she's in stealth, which I don't think is that great of an awakening skill. But the second awakening is apply soul in prison if an enemy is killed with this skill. With Death Dance. So I think that's really good. Uh, she gets a uh, damage increase on in her cat. Which is really good. So there you go for SS tier. So let's talk about SS plus tier. And why I put these characters in SS plus tier. These characters are AOE attackers. And the AOE meta is the strongest meta in the game. I doubt that the single target meta will come into fruition. Unless a lot of whales spend money and most whales uh typically just go with the easiest way to win and that's aoe so all these characters are aoe attackers uh pretty much all the characters at ss plus and ss tier are aoe attackers because aoe is the way to go there's no other way in order to really approach this game if you want to be a big brain you can not do aoe but aoe is the way to go Anubis is so strong because his AOE applies stun, and you'll notice that all these characters, all these characters, in SS Plus tier and SSS tier have good status effects with their AOEs. The thing about him is he actually removes stats from himself, and he applies curse. What I will say is he would like to be in a dark team. In all honesty. We like to be in a dark setup. He doesn't need to be though. But his raid skills dispel two random buffs, which is really good. And most of his skills are just basic, straightforward, solid skills. But his awakening increases his speed and 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 increases his stun. And increases his rage damage, which is really amazing for what you're expecting to do. Excuse me. Once you, once you start using Anubis, you'll see why he's so high ranked. Because his overall damage output is extremely high. Even when he does his single target attacks, he hits really hard. And that's what you want these characters at the top tiers to do. You want them to hit as hard as possible, and he can do that. And with his speed... It's quite likely he can rip through teams enough so your other AOEs can clean up. He's designed to be part of a 3 AOE attack strategy. Where one person hits with an AOE, another person hits with an AOE, and a third person hits with an AOE, and it is done. And he can perform really well in that vein, which puts him at the top of the list. Uh, our vet shouldn't be too much of a surprise why she's so high. One thing about our vet is she would like to go first. Because her rage skill actually applies stun. This guaranteed stun. I just want to mention guaranteed stun. If nobody has a status effect on her. So that's really good. So keep that in mind that you want her to have rapid speed. So she could go first. But it only gets better from here. She actually applies divide power on all heroes. Which increases their damage. So she's a buffer. And she has increased damage. And when you do have a status effect on the opponent, she increases the damage of her attack. Which is really solid, but she just wants her to stun people. That's what she's here for. She wants to go first. She wants to stun people. She wants to slow down the team and she wants to kill the team. And her awakening actually increases her speed, which I guess the devs understood that that's what she's supposed to do. Um, and she like drops a buff 
dispels a buff before doing damage, which is whatever, and she has increased damage. It doesn't matter. She does one thing. She goes first, she stuns, and then she starts ripping holes in the team. And because she's a warrior, she benefits from a high H, uh, a, a little bit more HP in defense, but her attack is higher, so she's more spec for offense, but she's really good nonetheless. Uh, Elementalist is a no-brainer. Elementalist is one of the best DPSs in the game, hands down, for a couple of reasons. Of course, her AoE applies stone, which is a constant theme amongst a lot of characters in the top tier. The other thing about her is her basic attacks constantly apply, us constantly hit everybody on the team. That's what makes her the core of the three AOE strategy, because she can constantly apply AOEs while the other characters are in cooldown. Because of this, you want her HP to be as high, her, her attack and HP to be as high as possible, so she can live and consistently apply damage every turn. And you'll see enemies disappear after that. That's why I have mine at 11 stars. I'm trying to get her to 12. Uh, of course, she actually has 10% damage increase. And she applies like weaken and armor shredder. So she applies status effects outside of stun. Her awakenings are pretty good. She increases her CC by 30%, which is really busted. And Elemental Rage actually applies... Randomly poison, armor shred, or weaken, and she increases her damage. She's one of the best AOE attackers in the game, and if you have the opportunity, I I suggest you invest in her because I'm investing in mine. I'm trying to get her to 12 star. Dang it! So we go go to Succubus, and she's kind of a game breaker. Succubus is like one of the most toxic characters out of the regular pool. Why do I say that? Her rage skill actually applies like four freaking uh, debuffs. At 100%, which is really, really, really broken. She's part of the core 3 AoE strategy. You would like her to go second after Valkyrie or Anubis. So she can apply these status effects and then your third your third AoE attacker, pretty much Elementalist, can clean up. But if you don't kill on the first turn or you don't like eliminate the enemy... You get aging, which reduces damage. You get decay, which increases received damage. You get reduced healing, and you get curse. Curse being the weakest of those stats, but only gets better as she actually has a 100% chance to apply frenzy. Attacks will cover HP of afflicted damage, which is really good. That's why she's uh, actually core in the AOE strategy. You, like I said, you like her to go second or third or first, depending on the team that you're building. And Seductress allows her to get the, of course, 10% damage increase. And common attacks have a 20% chance to seduce enemies, which makes them hit other units. Um, her awakening is, is uh, like Soul Whip acts, inflicts weakened and armor shredder, so she gets two more uh, status effects, which bumps her up to six. She gets damage increase, and you get increased life steal on Frenzy, which is super good. That really keeps your team alive. That's why she's one of the core units of an AoE strategy. She's pretty much one of the best characters in the game. She's kind of really toxic, though. That's why I don't talk about her much. She's a really toxic character. So, now we're going to SSS tier. These are meta breakers. Characters that you see in everybody's box or will see in everybody's box. So, let's talk about the best healer in the game, Super Twins. I think Super Twins is one of those broken characters that Everybody had to get or they didn't like like skip content really fast. I am one of those people. I regret not getting Super Twins because they're so good. But I'm working on Super Twins right now. The reason why she's so good is she really doesn't have a rage skill, so to speak. She switches between two forms, one attack and one heals. Bella does Sword of Doom on her turn, which does 102% damage. If the enemy has any buffs, a random buff will be converted to Seal of Doom. This is important because your opponents would love to have buffs because buffs can turn the tide of battle. So if the enemy has any buffs, a random buff will be converted to Seal of Doom. And after being like stacked three times, Seal of Doom will randomly apply uh, a status effect, which is not that important. Lucky Smile is one of her best skills, and that's through Ella. 
She purifies the whole team of one negative status effect. Super good already. Recovers Ella and Bella's HP equal to 360% of their attack. While at the same time acting as Lucky Seal on itself. When her healing overflows, it converts into an HP shield. So she gets increased healing, HP shield, and she heals the party. Super great. Of course, change the phase when she sacrifices herself and she starts going to crazy state. That's okay, but she revives everybody when she dies, which is super good. Because she's part of that rush AOE strategy that's so popular right now in the meta. So when she dies, she just starts AOE in every turn. That's when that's at the point you're looking to kill the enemy. Uh, first of all, with her awakening, she gets increased speed. And if, if Ella's alive, an extra buff will be converted to Scylla Doom, which is really good. And increased healing by 20%, which is really good. So she's overall one of the best healers in the game, like, kind of broken. So we go to the Chaos Heroes, and we'll end there. Uh, Blazing Dragoon is a very toxic character. I think he's one of the most toxic characters in the game. He's so toxic that it's kind of like offsetting people who want to play the game, but don't want to spend money and if they can't spend money to be the best it's it's kind of like it's kind of like a very toxic situation we start with heaven wrecking strike i already did a video on him so i won't go into too much detail but he actually deals damage to enemies in the front row at least three enemies and increases damage by the number of enemies and when his damage scales with the number of enemies it actually can scale downward with his awakening so just keep that in mind and this is the worst part he applies a damage shield after he rage kills which which is layer on top of other shields and will receive damage first which is kind of busted and then he gets bust gut which increases received damage which is pretty dumb and reduces received healing bust gut is a stupid status effect that he gets access to and once he reaches three stacks he gets silence of weariness pretty dumb uh, that's self-will. He actually gets 50 extra rage and he does more damage. He's just a busted character. Uh, he has permanent CC and he gains 10% damage increase and 20% crit rate. That's just on his fourth skill. He's pretty darn busted. And increases his bust gut skill. And like I said, his damage scales downward and upward. And he increases his, his, uh, his damage increase mod is 15%. So he's really a toxic character. Um, you'll only see him with super wells though. So don't be too scared. Be scared of Morian because you'll see more of her. And we're, we're seeing more and more of Morian as people get more access to her. She's another metal breaking character. One of the best DPSs in the game. First of all, both her and Blazing Dragoon are chaos characters. So their, their um, elements will blend. They'll be whatever element needed to actually get the maximum amount of statistical power for your elemental alignment so keep that in mind and when two of them are in the same team which should rarely happen unless you're well they'll actually buff up the weakest stat and actually increase your overall power so she actually she actually does aoe damage going with the aoe theme she attacks all enemies and applies weakening heal reduction these are really important because you reduce the overall damage they deal and the healing received and then after she attacks, she actually assassinates, excuse me, an enemy, a random enemy, and steals 20 rage for them, which is really good. And she has like damage dealt in life still. Super good. The fact that she has life still in her kit and she can assassinate is really good. She increases her, her speed with her awakening and dispels debuff, which is kind of whatever. The speed increase is more important. And she increases her damage by 50%. The fact that she is so fast and the fact that she hits first and assassinates and life steals and reduces stats and has so much sustain in her kit, it's really good. Um, these three units kind of break the meta, but that is the case with SSS tier. And I'm glad there's only three characters in SSS tier because it's a little too much for this game. But with that said... I hope you like my video. If you disagree with what I said, you can just go in the comments and tell me what I did wrong, something that you don't like. I'm not saying that it's perfect, but this is comprehensive based on experience. So anyway, give me a thumbs up 
Like, share, subscribe. I'll hit you later. Laters.